Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem. I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent, uh, County Extension Director with UF IFAS Extension, Nassau County, and this is part of our Landscape Matters program. And today we're going to be talking about dooryard fruits. So earlier this month, we had a whole program about citrus, and it was, I mean, it was a great program, but you know, citrus, it's a very traditional uh, fruit that tree that we can grow easily throughout Florida, but there's so many other fruits that we can grow that we thought it'd be wonderful to have of an additional program that's just all about a lot of our dooryard fruits or just how I say everything, everything but citrus. Um, of course, we're not going to have time to go through every single fruit tree uh, or fruit that we can grow in our homes, but uh, we will kind of gloss over a lot of the big key ones um, <clears throat> and um, that we can grow here and that can do very, very successful here. Um, so before we get going, um, let, let's go ahead and jump into the PowerPoint. And I wanna ask, um, what types of fruits would you like to grow in your garden? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. This is a super tasty one right here <laughs> in this picture. Looks like a tomato, but it's not a tomato, despite a tomato being a fruit. Uh, we have one comment, someone said that they did receive a banana um, and it is in a container. And then they are curious about what they need to know to plant it. So yeah, you can definitely grow um, <clears throat> bananas here, and um, but they are not cold or freeze tolerant. So the planting is gonna be best. We don't really talk about banana. We don't talk about bananas in this presentation because in North Florida, they're very, very finicky, but you can be successful with them. Um, so you can put, uh, bananas out in the spring after our last frost, and they need a lot of potassium. Um, if you want to say, I, at the end of this program, you'll get my email. Um, if you shoot me an email, I can follow up with those recommendations for growing bananas in our yards. So, oh, pomegranate. Yeah, pomegranates are wonderful. So again, because of our humidity and our temperatures, pomegranates are actually kind of hard to be successful here, um, especially from a commercial. Now you can grow them, but they're not gonna be the best pomegranate that you've ever had, but they're still can be pretty tasty. Um, at least commercially, Florida, we don't grow pomegranate, but we actually do propagate a lot of pomegranate and then ship them out to California where they're grown commercially. So fig trees, yeah, avocados, those are all wonderful. Um, ah, how do you care for and prune passion fruit vines in Central Florida 9B? So we can talk a little bit about that because we don't, we have a couple passion fruit that we can grow up in North Florida and Nassau County, but again, that can be a little bit harder. But those are really, really cool plants. Like, yeah, I mean, I do love passion fruit. Usually I don't prune them. Um, in that for that specific question. Um, usually what I will do is because you allow that that fruit is growing on a new growth, I will prune to reduce uh, the size of it and it can help improve lateral branching which could be potentially more fruiting and flowering and usually gonna be doing that after fruit. So, um, and then olives, yeah, that's a great question. Can we grow an olive tree here in North Florida? Uh, you can get lucky. Um, so we uh, in in 9A, you can grow olives. If you're in 9A, you can do olives. They are finicky. They need really, really well-drained soils. If you do not have well-drained soils, your olives are going to be very difficult to grow. But we're actually, there's a lot of research going on with olives in the state because it has the potential to be a commercially viable fruit that we can grow, um, which is really, really cool. And outside of Gainesville, Florida, in some of the research area. They're doing some research and test growing of different olives, as well as in the north part of the state. Up outside of Lake City, they're growing some for research. Great questions. Great questions. So with all of my programs, I always like to have what I call as essential questions. By the end of the program, you should be able to answer these big, broad questions. That means that I successfully helped cover the topic that I wanted to cover today. So what what are the environmental conditions and management practices that are important for dooryard fruits? And then which fruit types and varieties are recommended for homes? So environmental conditions. Um, what is the most important environmental consideration for majority of our dooryard fruits? Not all, but majority of them. Uh, what are your thoughts are? What are your thoughts? You can put in the chat box and 
I have some hints. Here's some hints. <laughs> So what is the most important environmental consideration that you can think of? Put that in the chat box. There should be a lot of movement. So <laughs> I had a lot of fun putting this slide together. So what we're seeing is obviously people are cold, chilly, there's sleepiness, you know, you've got Garfield sleeping in his bed and then up in the top, you have a clock. So one of those most important considerations that we need to consider when thinking about fruit and fruit selection for our yards is what we call chill hours. So chill hours is the number of the amount of hours that we need to spend below 45 degrees and above freezing. And that if a certain fruit trees require a certain period. If they don't reach that certain number of hours, they won't blossom. Alternatively, a big concern is, say you get a low chill hour fruit that you put in your yard, because there's like some peaches that you can put in your yard that only have like 200, 175 chill hours. So yeah, theoretically, we can plant them up in Nassau County, but the, the concern is, you hit 150 or 200 hours of chill hours, your tree may go to blossom or it may start to develop fruit. But then we're going to have those frost and freezes that could still come in and it's going to kill those blossoms or kill those fruit and then that tree won't be able to develop fruit um, for that season. So you got to like kind of fit within a tight window of that amount of chill hours and do a lot of selection based off of your chill hour availability. So a lot of the varieties that we discussed during the program today, when we're talking about specific fruits. The ones that we're showing you were selected for our chill hour requirements. And I'm going to send you this link in the, in the, um, in the follow up email. But let me show you this screen. I'm going to have to switch over to it. But there's this handy little website that you can come to. And it'll show you the current chill hours that you have within uh, your area. So there's a bunch of different stations that you can see each one of these little blips. Um, the closest one to us, um, it kind of depends, Brunswick or uh, the one out in Baldwin, but usually it's like the one up in, in, in Baldwin because um, it's more usually the closest to what we have, but there's not too big of a difference between these two nonetheless. So you can click on this and we can click on that data and it'll show you how many chill hours we've already received for this year. So um, historic average is 543. Last year, we have 371 hours, and this season, we're currently at 267. Now, based off the trends, we can kind of see where we are at, but usually we're looking around, I would usually say do 350 to 450 hours. Somewhere around there is a good chill hour requirement, um, but this is kind of a cool website that you can look and check your chill hours to kind of see where you're at. Um, approximately. Um, so let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation. So chill hours are really, really important. So traditionally, where this four to 500 uh, hours is where we're at in Nassau County. If you're on the far west side of the county, 500 to 600 hours. And if we look at those historic hours, that's pretty par. Uh, but we're seeing this shift uh, because of just uh, warming events. We've seen that those hours have been reducing overall just across the state. But usually if you're picking between, I usually say 350 to 450 hours, you're gonna be doing pretty, pretty good uh, for your chill hours. So this is really, really important when selecting your fruit trees because you need chill hours, but you need to be just right. Not too much, not too little, but you just need the perfect amount of chill hours. So you select your trees based off of that to have, make sure you have good fruiting. Um, and then if you're kind of like in a weird transition zone where it's inconsistent, you can have some fruits that have lower hours and some that have higher hours. So then you're always going to have something produced. You could still get both to produce and be successful. But if there's late free snaps, you'll still have something that could potentially grow and be still successful. So the next thing is just as part of our general recommendations, majority of these fruit trees are going to require six to eight hours of sun. They need well-drained soil, so they don't like too wet of areas. If it's too wet, you can get uh, root rot. 
Um, and they need to have a pH around 6 to 6.5. For most, a slightly acidic soil is going to be the best. Um, but there are some fruits that we can put in our yard that need acidic soils. Very common one that grows really, really well in North Florida is our rabbit eye blueberries. And we'll talk a little bit about those because those need an acidic soil. Um, and also good uh, air circulation is going to be required. So general nutrient recommendations. So some of the slides that we go over with specific fruit varieties, we are going to talk about some of their very specific nutrients, fertilizer recommendations. Um, but usually we recommend planting a lot of our fruit trees during their dormancy period. So that's gonna be December and January. You can plant them theoretically any time, but that is gonna be the best time that you can plant them is during that dormancy period. Um, and only put fertilizers, anytime you apply any type of fertilizer or nutrient to a tree, especially those if we're using a low grade granular, slow release fertilizer, um, you're just putting it underneath the drip line of the tree or under the canopy. Don't let the fertilizer touch the trunk because that can cause some damage. So make sure the fertilizer stays away from the trunk, the trunk, but then cover that area underneath the canopy or the drip line of the tree. Never put anything in the planting hole. Don't put, I know in the past, some people have put fertilizers into the hole that they plant, but that actually burns the new roots and it can cause damage to the roots, prevent it from establishing quickly. So you just want to put back that native fill that you pulled out, just put that back in when you're uh, planting uh, a lot of these fruit trees and um, only put fertilizers in. Usually you're going to start applying fertilizers a couple months after you plant. Um, so, but anyways, so use a low grade low grade so lower the number the better like a 10 10 10 an 8 8 8 or a 6 6 6 um, those are those lower grade uh, fertilizers that just means the percentage of nitrogen phosphorus and potassium or NPK is lower um, that allows you to really control the amount that you put down the higher the number you can easily burn the plants roots um, if you misapply and a lot of these plants like to be spoon fed a little bit amount. So you need to spread a little bit around that uh, drip line of that tree. Um, and it, too much will be bad and too little might not create a productive tree. So those low grade fertilizers and nutrients are gonna be the best to use. So we do have 10, 10, 10 or 8, 8, 8. You could do a 10, 0, 10, um, that second number phosphorus. We already pretty much have a naturally high level of phosphorus within our soils. So it doesn't require to, um, doesn't really require much unless you have a soil deficiency in them, in that nutrient. So you can have a 10, 0, 10 and 8, 0, 8 uh, as well. But each plant does have specific fertilizer recommendations. But one of the things is a lot of our fruit trees, there's limited research on those nutrient applications. So we have a pretty standard nutrient guideline for a lot of our plants that we can grow uh, for fruit, fruit producing trees. So, um, but it's also important that we do have a bunch of different, to know that there's a bunch of different pests that we can get onto a lot of these plants and diseases and pathogens. Some of those insect pests that we can see are um, like the plum curculio, stink bugs, scale, aphids. Um, they're common to see on a lot of our fruit trees. Um, for homeowners, you can do a lot of insect management by just scouting and squishing a lot of the insects that you may see collecting them, throwing them in a, a tub of soapy water, or um, you can cut prunes like parts of the trees out to remove uh, infestation. That's really helpful with aphids and scale. But if you end up having a lot of insects um, and, or pests, insects on your plants, you know, insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils can really go a long way and they're easy to get. I really like neem oil, but there's other oils that you can get. Um, <clears throat> and they can be really, really effective. So, you know, for homeowners, that's going to manage a lot of those insects that you can get onto your uh, trees. So I would avoid broad spectrum insecticides. You know, horticultural oils, they kind of are very indiscriminate, but if you apply specifically to those insects, it's causing them that damage, that's, that's great. Some of our insecticides that we put down are systemic, so it spreads throughout the tree, and those can be uh, non-selective. So 
that could end up impacting every single insect that touches your plant. So it could get into the pollen, it can impact pollinators like bees and butterflies. So avoid any broad spectrum non-selective uh, insecticides because you need pollinators to make your fruit trees be productive. So you probably shouldn't put anything down that could end up hurting the pollinators. Um, so being very selective and that horticultural oil can really, really help out and be effective in that management. Um, we have different pathogens. Every single plant fruit tree has certain different types of pathogens it can get, um, whether it's just fungus, a virus, bacterial infection. Um, so one of the key things is if you have the inability to recognize it or diagnose it, reach out to us. We can help with that diagnosis process. So we can determine what's that best management practice. Um, but a lot of things that we see that are common could be like leaf spots, anthracnose, uh, scab, canker, fire blight, uh, root decay. Um, but the biggest thing to help minimize any of these is just cultural controls. Apply water just to the roots don't use overhead sprinklers, minimize using any overhead sprinklers because that can lead to fungal pathogens on the leaves. Um, there's mechanical controls where you can easily prune out bad sections like fire blight. If that starts on one part of your limb or one branch of a tree, you can remove a big portion of that branch to help get that out of the tree. Um, but then there's other, you know, similar to neem oil, there's a copper fungicide spray and that can really help manage a lot of the other fungal pathogens. Uh, a lot of the fungal pathogens that can end up on your trees or your other ornamental plants. But the biggest thing is those cultural controls and making sure we're avoiding overwatering so we don't have rot and avoid overhead watering. So you don't want to overwater and you don't want overhead watering because um, those can have impacts on your trees and plants. The best method for watering um, trees if you don't have sprinkler system is just use a hose and just saturate the soil um, underneath in that drip line of that tree. So we're going to, um, these are going to be the specific dooryard fruits that we talk about um, because I know we only have an hour together. So we really limit on what are the ones that we know can grow well here that are really unique to the North Florida area. Um, and one of the ones that I did take off of this is fig. Um, Figs are actually considered invasive species. They have a high invasion risk classification now. Um, they still grow really well, but nonetheless, so we're just going to know, we're not going to talk about that one today just because of that classification of a high invasion risk because those figs that we use for growing fruit, edible ones, we're finding now popping up in a lot of natural areas and displacing some of those natural areas as well, which is a really bad thing. Um, so we avoided that, we removed that one from the list. Uh, but we are going to talk about apples, um, which usually when you're thinking about Florida, you don't think about growing apples, uh, but we can have some apples that we grow here. Um, there's peaches and nectarines, of course, uh, pears, plums, talk about persimmons, mulberry, uh, blackberries, and blueberries. And each one of those, you can see the parentheses, those are kind of like the general um, chill hour requirements that we can use for a lot of those uh, fruit trees. So I know we do not have strawberries on this uh, just because strawberries are currently fruiting and growing right now. Um, and, but strawberries are actually pretty easy to grow. Um, but we can, if you have any specific recommendations or questions about strawberries, we can help follow up with those. So let's talk about apples. So um, apples, you know, we can't grow Fuji Red Delicious or anything like that um, because they have chill hour requirements that are above 500 chill hours, 800 and some, 900 and some other varieties. So there's different types of regions where apples are developed and the apples that we actually grow here were developed and uh, cultivated originally in Israel and they do really well in our area. The only drawback that we do have is our high temperatures and high humidity can lead to different types of pathogens, et cetera. So you have to really keep a good eye out on them, but we can grow some small delicious apples um, in our landscapes. Um, so we do have limited cultivars, but some are the Anna, the, Do the Dorset Golden, which you see in this image right here, and a Tropic Sweet. They're smaller apples, about two, two and a half inches, but um, they are delicious. Um, I really like that Tropic Sweet, and I've had the Dorset Golden. I haven't had the Anna. Um, 
So apples are really good. Uh, they're easy, they're relatively easy to grow. Um, usually you're gonna be fertilizing one, p one pound uh, of fertilizer for each year of that tree's age. So three-year-old tree gets three pounds, one-year-old one pound, five, five years, five pounds, up to 15 pounds. Um, so, but then you divide that into two equal applications throughout the year. You're usually going to be doing a single application in that coming on a dormancy period, somewhere to January and March. And then you apply the other half in June. But it's going to be really important to look out for nutrient deficiencies. Apples are prone to nutrient deficiencies in zinc and boron, and they can impact the fruit development. So usually it could be kind of nice just to, um, in the summer, you can add uh, zinc, um, applications, or you can get some uh, fruit fertilizers that have extra zinc and boron put into them to make sure that we meet that uh, micronutrient recommendation. So the so you're applying that fertilizer just twice a year in your, uh, it's based off of that tree's age. So say you have a four-year-old tree, you're going to do four pounds of like a 10-10-10 or 10-0-10, and you split that up do two pounds in the January to March period, and then do two pounds in June. And we'll see a lot of the recommendations for a lot of these fruit trees are very similar to uh, that application recommendation. So these, um, these cultivars are apples. We can pretty much grow them in like, I don't know if you can grow them down in like Ocala, but we'll just say north of Ocala, these are some of the cultivars that we can grow in Florida. You can grow a little bit more out in like the panhandle of Florida, but um, in our part of the state, these are pretty much the only uh, cultivars or varieties of apples that we have the ability to grow successfully. So now we'll talk about peach and nectarines. So we do have, you know, peaches, nectarines, they're I mean, they're delicious, <laughs> you know, but usually we never really had too many peach or nectarine varieties that we could grow successfully in Florida because of our chill hour requirement. So there's different peach cultivars uh, that we do have the ability to grow. And we actually um, separate them in three different types of classification, or sorry, the peaches into two different types of classifications. There's the melting flesh and then the non-melting flesh. Um, the melting fleshes are the ones that get much softer as they age or the non-melting they do not essentially as they ripen. Um, but then also another little classification that I don't have it broken down in here is some are really easy to remove the pit, some are not um, as easy to remove, but we just broke them up into this. So those peach cultivars, um, there's essentially there's the Florida Prince, Florida Glow, Tropic Snow, Florida Dawn, Florida Crest, and Florida King. You can grow all of those here. Those are delicious ones that you can pull right off of the tree, you know, wash, and then you can immediately start eating them. Um, the non-melting flesh peaches, usually they're going to be a little bit firmer. They're really, they're just as good. They're also good for baking as well. Um, but your UF Gold, UF 2000, UF Blaze, and Gulf Prince. You can clearly see which ones UF has uh, developed. <laughs> Uh, the University of Florida has developed usually the ones that have Florida in front of them, as well as our, our uh, cultivars that we developed in the state. Um, and some of the nectarine varieties that we can grow um, are going to be our sun mist, like you see in the image on the right. Um, I just love that red color to it. The sun mist, sun coast, sun best, and sun racer. But they still need nutrients. So um, <clears throat> The nutrient requirements for peaches are pretty easy relatively, but uh, the first year is going to have different fertilizer recommendations than the subsequent years. And that is predominantly because of new trees need to be spoon fed those fertilizers. So too much, they're not going to uptake those nutrients or so you're going to be wasting the fertilizer or the second is you could put down too much and it could burn the roots, the new roots that you've been working on developing. Um, to help those trees get established. So in that first year, um, what you're going to do is you're just going to do like a quarter cup of tree. In February, do a quarter cup of fertilizer. In May or late May, you're going to do, a, uh, sorry, an eighth of a cup, your first application in February, a quarter of a cup. Um, I keep screwing up my numbers. Sorry, eighth of a pound or quarter of a cup, 
in February, a quarter of a pound, or which is a half a cup um, in May, and in July, you're gonna do a half a pound, which is about one cup per tree. Uh, so you see how it's small little spoon feeding during that first year and you're spacing it out every couple months. Um, but then after that, the subsequent years, it's similar to um, the apples. You're gonna be doing an application in January and an application in May. And you're gonna be using about one to one and a half pounds uh, per tree of that, of that fertilizer, which is, which is nice. But it's important to think about pruning and to help increase fruit set on your peaches and nectarines. So prune in an open vase pattern. So you want it to kind of be like upright like this. Um, and you want to prune in like January and February. Um, you can improve fruit by thinning marble sized fruit every six to 10 inches. So you'll see fruit that can develop along um, the branch, but to help really focus on the quality of fruit, once it starts to develop the, like the small little marbles, go through and remove every six to 10 inches, and then you'll have those fruits develop and not compete, and you're gonna have a much healthier or more um, robust fruit, higher quality fruit. And you kind of see in this image, you know, with them even removing them, those fruits kind of, those peaches, kind of sit right next to one another, bump, bump, bump. Um, look out for any pests. Um, the peaches and nectarines are known for tank caterpillar, aphids, and borers. Um, so just keep an eye on it. Uh, so these clean stone, that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. They adhere to the pit, free stone separates easily. Um, we mentioned the melting flesh uh, soft, softens rapidly as it rap, ripens and non-melting. Uh, it stays a little firmer longer. So that upright pruning January and February, usually that's where we're going to be seeing most of our pruning happen anyways. So it just kind of helps keep that structure and promote new growth that's a little bit lower. Um, and then that helps with that production quality of the fruit. Next, uh, we're going to talk about some of our pears. So we have multiple varieties that we can grow. Um, traditionally, a pear that we have grown in Florida is called the sand pear, and it is firm. It is hard as a rock, and it's not one that you'd grab off a tree and just bite into. It'd be, it's primarily used for cooking and baking, um, but we do have some of those softer pears uh, that we can actually grow in North Florida because of our chill hours. Um, so like the one that we see in this pimp, the image on the right, that's a Leconte. Uh, we also have Baldwin's, Carn, and Tennessee. Those are four uh, different pear varieties that we grow here. There's more varieties, but these are the most common uh, that we can grow um, and are going to be easier to find. But with the pears, they require pollinators. So if you have any type of pear, you're going to need at least two of them, not just one, you're going to need two. And the Baldwin is actually one of the best pollinators of all of our pears. So I would recommend for everybody is you can pick the pear that you want, but then also have a Baldwin pear as well to help make sure that you have a good pollinator there. Is it required? No, not necessarily, but it does really help. So with the fertilizers uh, for, the, for any of our pears, um, usually about doing one and a half pounds for each year of the age of the tree. So one and a half pounds at year one, year two is going to be three pounds, et cetera, all the way up until 15 pound max annually. And then you're going to just split that up into two applications, one in January and then one in June. So those are going to be a lot of those, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, again, that's similar to the other applications uh, trees, but you can definitely see that this one's a little bit more than the one pound. So that one and a half pound is going to be important. Um, and then again, use slow release fertilizers. And that's really recommended for all of these, especially the pear, because there's not much research on pears in Florida soils because they're really sandy soils. Um, we're not sure how well pears do in those sandy soils with nutrient uptake. So we make sure and put an emphasis on slow release fertilizers because you put down that first application in January, those fertilizers are slowly released into the soil for those pears to make sure that we're increasing that uptake efficiency of that nutrient so we're not wasting it because nutrients, um, 
which are part that come from many sources, including our fertilizers, is a contributor to our uh, pollutants that lead to algal blooms within our water bodies and can uh, impact our overall water quality throughout the state. So slow release is going to be really important um, just because of the fact that it does slowly release those nutrients to the trees. And that's really emphasized again with the pear just because we don't have all the information yet to really know what that uptake efficiency is of pears in our sandy soils. So this general application, this general recommendation is key and important to follow. But pruning pears is actually really important um, because it's going to help with the uh, overall production of the fruit. So um, you can see in the image on the right, there's like the before pruning and after pruning. And what you're doing is you're creating a co-dominant stem. So some trees have a, a dominant stem where it's one main trunk that you see just go whoop right up to the top of the tree, all the way up to the top. So we do this with pears where we kind of select three uh, co-dominant leaders uh, that we can use to kind of be our main structures for the pairing tree. And that's going to increase the lateral branching, which is really, really good because the more lateral branching that you do have, that increases the amount of um, fruit production, but also it encourages light to better enter the inside of the tree so you can have production on the interior portion of the tree um, as well. Um, <clears throat> And the pears, you kind of want to keep them on the tree as long as possible. They will ripen slightly after picking, um, but not too much. But it's really important to be very careful about how much you prune because excessive pruning leads to fire blight on pears, which is a bacterial problem that we can get. So, um, and then another reason that we do this pruning, pears are susceptible to um, all pears are susceptible to uh, limb breakage. So by doing this co-leader uh, or this modified leaders with these pear trees, what it does is it helps reduce, reduce the risk of those high risk branching that happens in pears that are susceptible to that breaking and splitting, which could end up uh, severely damaging a pear tree, killing it, etc. So this kind of helps prolong its life by making sure it has good structure. And each year, um, <clears throat> after you're harvesting uh, the fruit, you're removing dead fruit, your dead limbs, um, and then you're kind of making sure you do this thinning and structuring to help improve the overall structure because it does produce a lot of new growth each year. Um, next is the plum. So we have a, a lot of delicious plums that we can grow. I really like the Gulf Rose, um, um, but the varieties that we can grow, some that I really like, you'll notice the ones are developed by, floor, uh, by the university. They have a uh, Gulf in front of them. So there's like Gulf Beauty, Gulf Blaze, Gulf Rose, and Gulf Gold. Um, some other that uh, varieties, the Excelsior and Segundo, those actually come from Alabama, uh, but they do really well in North Florida as well. So all those varieties we can grow here in Nassau County. And usually we're going to be harvesting them May to June, but uh, plums do need a little extra space. So you're planting them about 15 to 20 feet apart. So you need some space uh, for the plums. It's not going to be a, a tight space tree, but you can get by with one of them. Um, more you have, of course, is uh, the better with pollination, but you can't get by with one. Um, so for the management, you're gonna irrigate twice a week. Um, and it's not much, but for a small tree, you're just doing two gallons of water for a small tree. The larger trees, you're gonna have about eight gallons of water. And we're doing it twice a week, which compared to some of our other fruit trees, that's not that much at all. Um, so making sure at least when, um, and sorry, and one of the reasons that we do that is because um, plums can be susceptible to root rot. So we really have to make sure that we manage the amount of water that we put down so it doesn't rot. So you have to be very cognizant of what's going down. So um, a heavy rain event might be more than enough rain for your plums um, for a week. So, but anyways, uh, fertilization, um, is going to be every six weeks 
from March through August, but the amount that you apply is dependent off of the on the age. So year one, you're gonna be putting down about four ounces of 10 0 10. Year two, you're gonna be doing about eight ounces. So you can see how it increases, it doubles each year up to one pound per application. Um, <clears throat> starting at year three plus. So you can definitely see how we're spoon feeding it, that nutrients and that fertilizer that first year, we increase it that second year and the third year, we're applying significantly more that March through August. So rather than the two applications, we're actually doing it every six weeks through that growing period. So this is a little bit different than those other fruiting trees that we talked about. Um, but I know that when we get a little crazy here with some of our really cold temperatures, we can drop below 25. Um, so if we do get to that point, it's gonna be important to cover your plants. Um, now commercially, we will actually irrigate the plants and let that water purposely freeze on the fruit. We do that in strawberry production, uh, plum production, because as that water freezes, it actually releases heat and actually kind of creates a little thermal jacket for the fruit. Um, but then you have to thaw it out properly. So the easiest thing for homeowners is to cover it. And uh, another strategy that you can do, because sometimes covering might not be enough for plums, is you actually put a light inside under the um, under the drop cloth that's covering the branch as well, because that provides a little heat that can help protect the plant from that cold. So uh, frost protection is going to be really important for plum because it can cause a lot of damage if we drop below 25. Now, I know that it might be rare in at least Nassau County, but it does happen, uh, and, but really important out in parts of the panhandle because that will happen out there regularly. So now we're going to talk about persimmons, yummy, yummy persimmons. Um, do, are, do any of you have persimmons in your gardens or have uh, thought about growing a persimmon? I'll put that in the chat box. If you do have a persimmon, what kind do you have? Because these are not always thought about, but they're getting just, they're starting to get, I think, more popular, or maybe that's just me. So, yeah. So I've seen people use persimmons. They don't, they do not taste like a tomato but they have a sweetness to them like a tomato where you can actually take huge slices of them like a tomato and you could put them on like sandwiches and stuff like that. You can cook them really easy. I mean, you can do a lot with a persimmon. You can pull right off a tree and munch on it, but it's important <laughs> to know that there's two different parts or two different variety types of persimmon. One is called non-astringent. The other is called astringent. So the non-astringent, you can pull it off of the tree and you know it might be a little firm, but it's gonna look nice and ripe and you could just yow, bite right into it and it is yummy tasty. The astringent has really high tannins. So if you pull it off of that tree and it's still slightly firm and you take a bite of it, oh, it turns your face inside out. It's like your mouth dries up. It's like, oh, it's a horrible experience. It's a funny prank, but it's a horrible experience. It just does not taste good at all. So, but the astringent varieties, you wait until they're really soft and squishy. Like they, they almost feel like they're going bad and they are absolutely delicious. They are so yummy. Um, so it's important to know that there are non-astringent and astringent. So non-astringent, are you, they don't have to be super, super soft and squishy yet, uh, but you can eat them really easily. The astringent, you just have to make sure you're eating it at the right timing. Um, but there are different varieties. Um, so within that non-astringent, they're not too cold tolerant. So the further south you go in the state, you can grow them more more varieties of them. So in North Florida, Fuyu and Jiro are the non-astringent varieties that we can do pretty well here. And they have a set, because of our cold and our research, they have a 75% survivability rate because of their cold, due to their cold tolerance, which is still pretty good. Um, there's some others that we can grow there, grow here, but they're like 50% survivability. So I'm like, ah, Dude, uh, but those are still available. You can get those. So, um, but the astringent, the Eureka and Yomobo are 
100% survivable. So we can have our bad freezes that come through here and they'll be successful. So persimmons are delicious and they're, they're small, about three inches uh, in diameter. They look kind of like a tomato, but they do not taste like a tomato, that's for sure. Um, but they are yummy, yummy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those maintenance requirements. So, um, so here's a Giro non-astringent variety. Also, you can see in this picture. Um, but the management is, you know, it, it's kind of nutrient management. I have a chart that kind of breaks it all down because each year is completely different up until you get to about 10, it's 10 years of age, which is a little frustrating uh, because each, there's nothing consistent that you do with the persimmon each year. Um, but it's based off of the age. You do 50% of the annual fertilizer application in March, and then you do a June and September, you do the main remaining 50%. So it's 50, 25, 25. So March, June, September, are the times that you are applying uh, your nutrients and you're putting most of it down, half of it down of the annual requirement in March. Um, if you want to remember this formula, that's the formula <laughs> to come up with how much fertilizer, but I'm going to send you all the chart um, to determine at what age um, is the amount of fertilizer that you do put down. Um, so that formula is the annual it's one plus the age minus one times 0.75. So um, max of the 7.75, um, which would be at 10 years old. Um, so the pruning is follow the same pruning recommendations of Paris. So after fruiting, you can come in and do that same structuring. Um, I know some people that never prune their persimmons other than if it's like dead branches or they're unhealthy and they still are pretty good production. Um, they're not as susceptible to breakage as pears, I believe, but it's going to be important that you can prune them like the pears and it can improve fruit production. Um, you're going to irrigate new trees two, two to four times a week, which is a lot, but they are very drought tolerant. So you can slowly wane that back. And you'd only have to water them once we are in periods of drought. And you can actually see when the persimmons start to be a little in droughty conditions because leaves start to droop and drop a little bit um, and they're crunchy. They start to feel a little crunchy. That's your sign to water them. But at first, you need to make sure you give them, water them two to four times a week, but you're giving them in small doses during that time. And you can slowly increase the amount and pull back the frequency um, while that plant, that persimmon starts to get um, adjusted. Now we do have a native persimmon too, but it's not gonna be pr producing this type of fruit. Um, and that native persimmon is actually, I mean, it's a good tree. Um, it's really amazing ornamentally as well, but um, these are the ones that are predominantly used for fruit production for consumption. So uh, next we'll talk about mulberries. So mulberries, any of you have a mulberry tree? By any chance? There is the invasive paper mulberry, but it's different than this. Not quite the same, they just look similar. So mulberry trees, they need some space because <laughs> they are, they're trees. They're just large trees. Um, I used to have a, um, white mulberry in my backyard when I used to live in High Springs. And I could literally just put buckets out <laughs> in the morning and, and like random spots underneath the tree. And I could come out later on in the afternoon, those buckets would be full. <laughs> they produce so much fruit, but they're large trees. Um, so they're great ornamentally. They're amazing trees ornamentally, but they're also very heavy fruit producers, which is really, really cool. And if you really like attracting birds to your landscape, this will definitely do it as well. But there's three different, I don't want to say varieties, that's the wrong term to use on this page. There's three different species of mulberries that we can grow really well. There's the black mulberry, the red mulberry, and the white mulberry. Um, and there are different varieties of the red mulberry, like the Hicks Everbearing, Johnson, Stubbs, Townsend, Illinois Everbearing. So those are all um, different varieties of that red mulberry. And the red mulberry is actually really good fruit production for consumption. Um, that's why there are so many varieties of it. And the black mulberry, that's typically going to be just black fruits. The red mulberry is typically just going to be red fruits. And the white mulberry is going to be white, red, black. <laughs> it's going to be a whole mixture of color. So um, I know that sometimes it's a little confusing, but um, mulberry trees are large trees. They like full sun. You, 
don't have to do anything with them. They're very self-sufficient, require very little water or fertilizers. Um, honestly, I've never, I don't think I've ever, I don't, I never fertilized my mulberry. So it just kind of grew and I just harvested its fruit. <laughs> Some of it, not all of it, my goodness. But yeah, um, they are large trees. They will get about 40 feet wide and 40 feet tall. So they're really awesome canopy trees. And you're not going to, unless you're pruning it to keep it short, once it's mature, you know, you'll have to get ladder to collect the berries or you do what I did and just put a bucket down and collect them as they fall. Um, but prepare to sneeze. <laughs> the, the pollen from these trees, they will send you into a sneezing fit. So if you have high allergies or bad allergies, I wouldn't recommend doing the mulberry because once it's once it's going into its fruit production cycle and it's flowering, that that pollen will send you on a sneezing fit. Um, so just keep that in mind if you end up using a mulberry. But mulberry fruit is oh my goodness, it is wonderful. It is delicious. So um, if you have the space for this and you want one, they're very low maintenance and they fruit heavily and they're delicious fruit and they're easy, really easy to manage and take care of. So now we're going to talk about blackberries. Um, so blackberries, there's different types of varieties. So we have um, erect thornless blackberries, like the variety is called Arapaho. Um, we have trailing, um, which does require pollinators on um, there, but the Uklawaha and Florigrand, those are wonderful varieties. Um, and then we have the erect uh, thorny ones, which is Brazo and Kiowa. So all of those varieties are absolutely delicious. Um, we grow them, they grow wild in Florida. Um, like in the image here, we have a wild blackberry. Um, but usually I, I like the trailing blackberries and you can trellis them pretty well. I mean, you could do this with the erect as well, but um, you can train them to grow onto a vertical trellis. So it has a reduced footprint um, in your garden. Um, and then you can put different varieties along there so they're making sure they're pollinating, et cetera. One of my memories that I have when I was learning how to garden growing up at my grandpa's house is we had a giant row of blackberries. And it's just like, I would just be out there just eating blackberries while I'm supposed to be collecting them. <laughs> so, um, but the blackberries, they're great. And they're easy to propagate too. So if you had a wild crazy blackberry that you're wanting to prune you can literally prune off a new growth section that's 18 inches long and just stick it in the ground and you can actually be pretty successful with it which is really cool um prune those old canes to the ground uh, for those erect um blackberries prune them to the ground because that's going to keep it condensed growing and encourage that new growth because most of the berries grow on that newer growth. So it kind of keeps a more compact, flush, dense growth of blackberries. Um, so your first year though, of you're gonna have um, this first year non-producing growth. It just kind of shoots up. It doesn't produce a thing at all. You're gonna just prune that back, not all the way to the ground, but you're gonna prune that back uh, to 30 to 36 inches because then it's gonna become a bearing stem afterwards or bearing cane. And then you can start doing your management uh, pruning after that. So <clears throat> those prune, those production canes. So those canes that start to um, produce fruit, you can prune um, those old, old ones that are about more than three to four years back to the ground. Um, but every two to four years, you can prune them back to about um, 18 to 12 inches height. So again, that's helping keeping it condensed. The ones that you're trellising, like the trailing canes, um, you just prune back to about 48 inches to encourage more branching. Um, and you can trellis and train them to go up onto those trellises, like I mentioned. Like I prefer the trailings uh, blackberries compared to the erects because of it's easy to train them up on those branches and a small footprint in a garden. Uh, but I mean, if you want to have an edible landscape, you can put blackberries in your ornamental beds and I mean, they would look beautiful. So uh, for fertilization, spoon feed, spoon feed, spoon feed, spoon feed, because they're actually very susceptible to burning. Um, so if you put down any nitrogen too much, 
zomp, you're going to fry and kill those roots and you're going to kill your blackberry. So that first year, use about a quarter of a pound of nitrogen uh, of fertilizer, a uh, low grade, uh, per plant, um, or it's up to five pounds for a hundred foot row. So if you're training it, the trailing blackberries, five pounds for a hundred feet, or just quarter pound per plant in that first year. After your first year, you're going to do an application in the winter and then in the summer. Um, and then you're going to be doing a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to be doing a half pound to a quarter pound to a half pound per plant or about 10 pounds per 100 feet in row. So you can see that after that first year, it increases a little bit. Um, so you're going to be doing that winter application and then you're going to do an application in the summer after fruiting. Um, <clears throat> So, but again, you can see that's a small amount compared to some of the other plants, but that's just because it's susceptible to root burn. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about some blueberries. There's different varieties, types of blueberries. We have rabbit eye and southern high bush. Rabbit eye varieties are the ones that we can grow here. Southern high bush are those cultivars of uh, blueberries that were developed for commercial production in central and south Florida. So we get too many chill hours for them here. So we have two different uh, blooming varieties or periods of our rabbit eyes. So we have our early and mid to late. So if you do a planting of that's like a mixture or combination of the two, you have a really cool long extended period of fruit production of your blueberries. Um, so the Becky Blue, for those early varieties, the Becky Blue and Bonita and Climax are um, <clears throat> great producers. But um, the Climax, if you're gonna use that one, you need to make sure that you're using a Becky Blue and Bonita as well. Climax does produce a really good blueberry fruit, but if you're limited on space, um, I wouldn't use the Climax. So you can use Becky Blue or Bonita. Um, but a mid, a mid to late uh, blueberry will be Brightwell, Powder Blue, Tiff Blue, and Woodard. So the Tiff Blue is a really popular one, it's super tasty, same with that Power Blue. But um, I mean, you can pick whichever variety that you really want, but those are the ones that do uh, pretty well in uh, North Florida. Um, but as long as you're sticking with those rabbit eye varieties, you're gonna be successful. Um, but do not use any of the southern high bush. Um, and usually when you're picking out blueberries, uh, they're going to have that classification if they're rabbit eye or southern high bush. But typically, I don't even know if we can find southern high bush in uh, nurseries here. Pruning blueberries is really important. So pruning, um, once they, it happens, once they're about four to five years old, um, remove 25% of old canes. So those main predominant vertical uh, parts of the blueberry. So remove about 25% of them, um, starting at, the, at their four to five years. And you can do that each year after that. And it's gonna help improve structuring. The older canes get removed because after a while, after like that five year mark, they stop producing fruit. Um, so what you can do is remove those older canes focus on having those younger canes as part of that blueberry. And then that's gonna make sure that you have um, a prolific or better fruiting on that blueberry. And even if those older fruit, those older canes that aren't necessarily getting removed, you can always cut off the top like six to eight inches of those um, branches. I just kind of keep it more condensed and lower. So it's easy to harvest and um, pick the fruits, so. Um, and then also with those first year plants, we recommend just removing flowers. Don't let it produce that first year. Let it focus on root development and establishment. So on your one year plants, just remove all the flowers. Don't let it go to fruit. This is kind of strange, I know, but um, it really does help out in those subsequent years. Um, so different than the soil recommendations from earlier, blueberries need an acidic soil. If you do not have an acidic soil, you can actually just build a raised bed and fill it with a 50-50 mixture of pine bark and peat moss. Um, and then that's gonna have a really acidic, well-drained soil that you can plant your blueberries in and they'll be happy campers. Um, one of my good buddies has about 15, 20, blueberries in his backyard and what he did is he just built a big raised bed that he just filled with peat, 
peat moss and pine bark and they've been wonderful ever since. But you're going to be planting them about 10 feet on center because blueberries do need to make sure they have good circulation uh, around the plants. Um, and also because of its growth pattern, you want to make sure it has good space. So you are going to be, again, spoon feeding this like the other plants. Uh, you're going to do an application in April, June, August, and October. But you're going to be doing one ounce, one ounce per, for its age per application. So if, if it's a five-year plant, you're going to be doing five ounces um, per application. If it's its first year, one ounce per application. Um, and you're going to want to make sure you use a specific nutrient recommendation because blueberries um, are susceptible to deficiencies. Um, so usually you can actually find a blueberry fertilizer mixture. Um, hydrangea and Camilla, 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 um, I am, for some reason, I cannot say that word today. <laughs> uh, camellias, that, that same type of um, fertilizer you can use for blueberries and be su successful, but you should be able to find specific blueberry fertilizers. Um, and it's going to have that ratio 12, 4, 8, 2. And that 2 is going to be magnesium, which is going to be important because your blueberries need to have a higher rate of that compared to other fruiting trees. Um, and so make sure that you are following those nutrient recommendations. Otherwise, your blueberries will not produce and they will not produce well um, if they do. Um, they need about 80 inches of water a year. Sorry, 40 inches of water a year. So thinking about irrigation, how do we irrigate it? We have our wet season and our dry season. So usually when they're really actively starting to really actively grow is before our wet season begins. So you're going to want to put down about a 0.6 to 1 and 0.2 inches of, of, of water a week in March. Um, but only put down the water if rain is not sufficient. There's a lot of times throughout the year that rain is more than sufficient, so you do not and should not irrigate your blueberries. So they need about 40 inches of water a year, but really only irrigate if rain is not sufficient enough because two blueberries too are susceptible to root rot. So you don't want to put anything down that could cause them disease or sickness. So um, anyways, so these are the, the dooryard fruits that we talked about. There's so many other, like I mentioned, fruits that we can grow. Like there's, uh, um, <clears throat> we talked about bananas, there's avocados. Those are great fruit trees that we can grow here. Those cold hardy ones, um, the strawberries were mentioned. So those are all wonderful other fruits that we can grow here. Um, <clears throat> So there's, there's a lot that we can grow, but, you know, these are some of those big ones that we can be very successful with um, and can be relatively easy to grow. And they're good substitutes if you're not doing uh, citrus trees. So we talked about the apples, peaches, nectarines, pears, plums, uh, persimmons, mulberry, blackberries, and blueberries. Um, so we covered these essential questions, you know, the, the, the general environmental conditions management for dooryard fruit and which types of fruit types and varieties are recommended for our homes. Um, but, you know, our county extension office, we're in Callahan, so you can always come over and say hello to us. Um, you can stop by during normal business hours. We do have our Yulee Annex, which is over off of Pages Dairy Road, uh, but we don't always have it staffed, but you can always uh, call this number, reach out to the Master Gardener volunteers. Um, or you can shoot me an email, give me a, give me a call, but we're here to help you, um, especially if you're starting to grow these fruit trees, make sure that we give you the best recommendations to be successful in those managements. Or if you're having issues with anything in your landscape, you can reach out to us for any questions that you may have. Um, but anyways, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and I'll keep this slide up for a moment. So if you need to write any down the contact information, um, but since now that we're coming up towards the end of our program, I wanna make sure that I open up the floor for any questions that you all may have about any other specific fruit trees or any fruit plants that you, fruit bearing plants that you would like to grow for consumption in your yard. So thank you everybody. And I will be following up with all the information or information related to this program, including those, a lot of those publications that, um, that relate to a lot of the fruit that we discussed, which includes the very specific fertilizer recruiting recommendations for some of them, et cetera. So thank you all for joining us today.
So I do have uh, one question is what recommendations do you have on growing grape vines in Nassau County? So we can grow grapes um, and we're gonna be predominantly growing bunching grapes, um, but our native muscadine grape actually grows really, really well here. You see the vine growing all within the canopies all over Amelia Island and outside, um, you know, even the Callahan, all of our natural wooded areas. Um, you're gonna have a lot of muscadine grapes growing. So you can be very successful with them. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that the spacing and trellising is done correctly, because that can be the difficult part is making sure that you're training them for production of fruit, um, but they can be uh, very successful here. Um, and they're pretty tolerant of our cold temperatures. So. So one question is, where do we purchase fruit trees? So there's a lot of different resources. You can't always just go down the street and find these specific apples from like our big box stores. Um, sometimes you can go to our local nurseries and you can order them and they'll bring them in as part of their wholesale. Um, but we do have, and I'll send a list of some recommendations um, in that follow-up email, but we do have, depending on where and how far you want to travel, we do have some nurseries that are within and now within um, an hour and a half to two hour drive where you can find a lot of this, uh, a lot of these plants, um, but it can be a little bit harder to find them, but I will send the list of some of those good fruit bearing tree nurseries that you can find. So um, here's one question. It says they have over overhead water on 20 fruit trees and 40 blueberries, um, and they don't want to redo their water system. I mean, I don't blame you. That's a big, that's a lot to do, a lot to do. Um, what recommendations for watering do you have? So um, it's really easy if there's a couple things. You can actually easily convert, depending on how the system is set up, you can convert systems to micro jets, and you can put micro jets onto each individual tree. Um, those are really easy. That's really easy to do. It's just snapping on a pressure regulator on that, that zone. And then um, you put that pressure regulator on that zone. And then what they can do is you can easily plug in all that. Or if you have overhead irrigation and it's not easy to put in micro systems or anything like that um, effectively, water in the morning, don't water at night. Do all your watering in the morning if you have to run that system that allows excess moisture to evaporate off of the plants. Because if you water in the late afternoon, evening, that water may not evaporate that's on the leaves and the canopies. So as that water sits during the humid, cooler times of the evening and night, that water sits there for a much longer time, you're increasing your risk of fungal pathogens. So make sure that you're going to be watering in the morning to allow for excess water to kind of evaporate. So, but if you are interested in thinking about how can I convert this system to micro jets, uh, which is just a micro spray system that works wonderful for fruit trees, um, reach out to me. I can help you make that conversion. It's, it's surprisingly easy. It's just a matter of getting all the equipment and to do it. And it's easy to do if you have well. It's easier, it's easy to do if you're on like municipal water. Um, you can do it on a well as well, but um, there's just more maintenance that might be required because the amount of iron that's in the system that could lead to uh, clogging over time of the system, so it makes it less effective. So, um, but we could talk more about that if you're interested. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share. I think. Let me see. But. Um, I will follow up. I have our uh, the survey that I use as part of all of our programs. Um, I'll send that out through the email uh, just because we are running, we run low on our time together. But um, feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any questions about uh, any of these uh, fruit varieties that you'd be interested in growing in your yard or your garden. Um, and um, always reach out to our, our county extension office if you have any questions horticulture related. Um, and we'll be happy to help you all out. So I want to thank everybody for joining us and I will follow up with all this, these resources and information.